All right, everybody, we're going to shift gears a little bit and bring you to the Gulf of Mexico. So I worked at the uh, Hart Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies as a postdoc uh, for a couple years. And uh, there I worked with a grad student, Kesley Gibson and uh, Greg Stuns. And uh, we, we had an opportunity to uh, start exploring some of the first uh, movement patterns of some large sharks there. I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the work we did on scalped hammerheads and tigers. Um, they've continued working with other species such as makos. Um, and uh, I'm down at Florida Atlantic University at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute now, uh, so I'm just down the road here. But I thought it'd be a great uh, opportunity to update you guys on what we did about two years ago uh, with OSEARCH and how that's kind of folded into a much larger study. So uh, sharks are very popular in Texas and many parts of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Texas uh, maintains one of the largest land-based uh, shark fishing um, uh, pressures in, in the entire country. Uh, it's very big here in Florida as well. I know some people are working on that now. But, uh, you know, we've got very good, his we had very good historical data on uh, what anglers were landing there. And uh, we actually published a paper um, a few years ago showing that a lot of those uh, larger sharks have declined and the composition has changed. And uh, in addition, there are some other pressures, particularly in Texas, given its proximity to Mexico. Um, every year, um, Mexican lanchas, which are these small boats um, that are targeting sharks and snapper, get confiscated by the U.S. Coast Guard. So it's, it's kind of an issue there. And uh, unfortunately, there's, there's not a lot of information on sharks in that area, um, particularly the larger uh, species. So uh, we don't know much about inshore to offshore connections. So folks that are um, fishing along the shore, what sort of repercussions does that have for a species that might spend some time offshore on a reef or something like that? And generally, the large-scale migration patterns of sharks in the Gulf of Mexico have been uh, poorly described. And that really limits our understanding of what habitats they're using, if there's spots that uh, sharks might be aggregating that might be important for conservation. So, we tried to uh, uh, get at that a little bit in here. Interestingly, um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico also has a lot of artificial habitat. You guys might be familiar with these. These are oil and gas platforms. And when I was actually first hired to work at the Hart Institute, we were looking at um, some of the impacts of decommissioning these rigs into reefs. So you may have heard of the Rigs to Reefs program. And it's a very big uh, controversial thing in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're looking at uh, actually reef fish communities that were hanging around uh, these platform legs that get basically sawed off or pushed down into reefs. And you can see it's quite a, quite a sight. And by the way, some great photos here. These are all Rob Snows, and he's a standing photographer. So we're actually doing a, a survey using a remotely operated vehicle. And oftentimes, we'd see uh, these guys. These are scalped hammerheads. And these are shots from the ROV. Uh, at these rigs to reef sites. So we'd see um, individuals, uh, such as on the left, but also big aggregations of scalloped hammerheads that you see on the right. So that kind of begged the question, well, are these things serving as a, an artificial seamount? So we knew that there was a lot of good data from the Gulf of California by Peter Klimley and his, his colleagues that uh, they tended to aggregate around natural seamounts that are coming out of the the crust of the earth, so maybe there's something going on there um, with those. <clears throat> so this is a map showing you uh, the Gulf of Mexico, particularly the western half, and every little black dot you see there is an oil platform, okay? And then in the red stars, those are platforms that have been converted into an artificial reef. And then the green triangles are showing you um, some natural uh, features out there. So. We have really exciting features like the flower garden banks, right, which come up along the shelf edge. And it's a fantastic dive site and uh, provide, you know, a habitat for a lot of, a lot of things. And, uh, you know, so there's not just art, it's not all artificial in the Gulf of Mexico is the point I'm trying to, to drag on here. So our questions were to first describe, you know, what are these movement patterns of, of large sharks in the northwestern Gulf? But then we wanted to really look a little bit more at what are some of these habitat associations? So uh, do they tend to hover over natural banks versus artificial reefs versus uh, these platforms? 
And uh, we teamed up with OSearch, and we teamed up with the Texas State Aquarium, and we, they created a, a fantastic exhibit uh, in Corpus Christi uh, where folks could uh, follow our sharks along with the uh, Global Shark Tracker app, and it wound up being a huge success for the, for the aquarium and ourselves combined. So the way we caught our sharks was a little bit different than the way OSearch does, some similarities, uh, but we use this gear we call hand lining. Um, this involves a, a very large buoy, which is like the red one you see there, and a small white buoy. And uh, we put a, uh, either a live fish or, or dead bait uh, hooked to, to, the, uh, to a large uh, monofilament line, and that basically is, um, is cut to the length of the bottom depth, and it drifts along structure. So what we would do is we'd go up to these oil and gas platforms and drift uh, these baits alongside them, and when we see a, uh, the floats go down, we pick up the shark and uh, do our thing. So all the animals that we tagged were fitted with Spot 5 transmitters. Uh, these were um, a special edition of them that were specced out based on what OSearch learned as being really, uh, um, really helpful for ensuring transmission. So they're coated in black anti-fouling paint. They had uh, copper sensors and an extra stiff uh, antenna. Um, and then we obviously made them all public on the Global Shark Tracker. So when we get our data, we get a bunch of points, right, that have uh, GPS coordinates uh, associated with them. But to analyze them in a meaningful way, we had to filter them for high-quality estimates because we were really looking at a relatively fine scale how these points uh, were distributed relative to some of our habitats of interest. So we use uh, ArcGIS and uh, filter these guys out, and we created these sort of heat maps that you see on the bottom half. So these are basically uh, surfaces that uh, interpolate a density or of, of how, um, how much activity is in a certain location. And then we looked at this statistically to see if some of those proportional point densities were higher versus lower on some of those habitats of interest. So I just want to show you a video right now. how we caught our sharks and all that. So this was all hand line. Uh, that hand line that that gentleman's pulling in there is about 1,200 pound test. The great thing about that is we can get the sharks right up to the side of the vessel, you know, within a couple of minutes. It's great. Um, so here's a tiger shark here. You can see the platform in the background. So again, we're drifting right alongside those. Uh, hooked nice in the corner of the mouth. We applied a uh, tail rope and then we start getting in, involved in getting all of our tags on. So this was pretty uh, challenging to do over the side of the boat. This is a calm day. Uh, that's why this video probably exists. And there we are securing um, that spot tag to the fin. You see, again, it's coated in black anti-fouling paint. That's interlux paint. And eventually, we uh, clip the circle hook. And we use uh, triple strength carbon steel circle hooks. Uh, they were nice because they actually break very easily with a, uh, they're super strong, but they crack very easily with bolt cutters. And that's actually Madeline swimming away there with her spot tag. So she gave us a lot of great data. So in the end, uh, we, we tagged, at least in the first rel or the first uh, wave, um, about five scalloped hammerheads and uh, four tigers. So the scalloped hammerheads that we were getting access to for the most part, we're all males, okay? And uh, we continued this afterwards, and we still, they still tend to get males out there. And then the tiger sharks, we're getting a mix of males and females. So the, the data I'm showing you are from the individuals that are in black face here, or, or black uh, font, I should say. And uh, the ones that are starred, those are individuals that we um, uh, tagged uh, on Expedition Gomex in November of 2015. So uh, there's a picture of Chris and Brandon there uh, fixing a uh, larger spot tag. That's, uh, I believe, Finley, who also gave us a lot of great data. And it was great to, to work on the O-Search vessel because maneuvering a large shark like that is, is extremely challenging. And, and the video I showed you with Madeline, she was luckily a smaller animal, but there was another case where we had a shark about the size of Finley. And uh, we had the spot tag all set up, and we were ready to go. And we hit a wave, and the shark basically uh, bent its fin against the uh, boat and cracked the $2,000 tag in half. So it's really nice to be able to work in this setting. 
So what did the sharks do? Okay, so this crosshair in white here, this is showing you uh, essentially where we released all these animals. This is a nice deal because we had an opportunity to uh, kind of release animals from one spot. In gray, those are the scalloped hammerhead tracks, okay? In uh, red, those are the male tiger sharks. You can see one of them who kind of made a, a, a jaunt over to Campeche Bank. And then the female tigers are in pink there. We tend to hang out a little bit on the shelf edge. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if we take the depth under each of those uh, spots, so the spot positions are at the surface, of course, but if we take the underlying depth below it, uh, this is what you see. So the scalped hammerheads are in gray, and the two uh, male tigers are in red, the two females are in pink. So what probably jumps out to you is that the tigers tend to uh, move over very deep water habitats, in particular, the males who are in red there. So you, they're over water that's thousands of meters deep as they're making these cross-basin uh, um, moves in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is now one of those heat maps using those point density uh, features in ArcGIS just to bring out kind of where these animals were transmitting along the shelf. So these are three representative uh, scalloped hammerheads. You can kind of see they kind of hang out in the middle of the shelf before it drops out real deep. So they tended to prefer the 40 to 60 meter range. And the tigers uh, were kind of all over the place. So particularly the males, go figure, right? Uh, so they're on the left and uh, making those moves across very deep water. The females on the right, you can kind of see quite a bit of activity on the shelf edge. And uh, if, I, if I actually overlay these white boxes, you can see that the centers of activity are essentially over the midpoint of some of these natural banks. Okay? So if we zoom in a little more, you can see that uh, one of them there on the left, uh, I believe that's Madeline, she spent a lot of time over the East Flower Garden Bank. And then uh, Joseph, who's actually on the right, he's actually a male, but he was uh, also spending a lot of time over there as well. And then this was uh, Findlay. Uh, she had a, a really big hot spot that literally surrounds the midpoint of these natural banks. So there's no question that they were you know, on these sites. So we did a little bit of statistics to look at whether there were some differences between species, uh, in, excuse me, individuals and by habitat. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of skip through this. But if you were to take each individual and look at their mean proportional point densities at each of those three habitats, okay, so again, those points that overlie uh, these habitats, you can see on the left, you got the scalped hammerheads, uh, not too much of a pattern there. But on the right, uh, you can see that a couple of those uh, tiger sharks, in particular two females, uh, spent the, major the most amount of time over those natural banks relative to those other habitats. So I think there's something important going on there. But this is limited data, so we had to reach out. And luckily, on Expedition Gomex, we linked up with uh, David Wells and some of his group in Galveston, Texas. And they've actually been tagging scalloped hammerheads for a couple of years before we came along the block. So what we're doing right now is we're uh, leveraging some of the data that we're able to collect on, uh, off the South Texas coast and combining it with uh, some work off of Louisiana and Alabama and a little bit northwest of Florida. So these are now showing you 50% kernel density estimates, uh, which basically give you an indication of uh, a bit about the range of these animals, which is not as big as you probably expect. So scalloped hammerheads we're not really seeing make some very large migrations, actually at least from what we can tell from the spot tags. Um, and we are getting some uh, male versus female distribution data. So for scalloped hammerheads, they seem to be, um, males seem to be more broadly using the shelf. Uh, and the females that we have, although the sample size is pretty low, uh, there seem to be more activity on the shelf edge, as it were. And now we're, we're starting to get uh, a little technical. So, so we're starting to look into some of these uh, potential uh, explanatory drivers that uh, may explain why they're distributed the way they are over the shelf. So this is, these are some preliminary results from some generalized additive modeling. Uh, so some folks at Galveston are doing this. You can see on the right, actually, um, that bottom right feature is showing you that um, the sharks don't seem to like to be very far from natural habitat features, is what that's explaining. Okay, so as you get away, the more unlikely they are to be located uh, that far away from a, a hard bottom habitat. 
So in conclusions, the sharks in the Northwest Gulf are certainly bridging connections between the shelf edge, mid-shelf, and coastal habitats, uh, some species obviously more than others. And there seem to be uh, maybe a little more restricted in terms of uh, their um, home range for scalloped hammerheads, whereas tigers appear to be no, no, more nomadic, uh, particularly the males, okay? So, uh, and that's, that supports some data that was uh, shown in the Northwest Atlantic by James Leah and his colleagues in 2015. So they tracked tiger sharks moving all throughout the entire Northwest Atlantic. Bermuda, down the Turks and Caicos, over to the uh, continental shelf of the US. Uh, we're not quite seeing that in the Gulf of Mexico. There seems to be maybe a more uh, retained population, but uh, more data will certainly tell. And obviously, the male sharks, particularly the tigers, traversing the open, open basin waters of the Gulf over to Mexico, that, that lends some concern over their vulnerability to fisheries. Uh, over there. So uh, I just want to put one little note in here. Uh, this is the shark that actually uh, made the biggest move out of the Gulf of Mexico. It was not the biggest one. This is a sandbar shark that we acoustically tagged. So what you're seeing on the fin there is an externally attached acoustic tag, right? So these tags only, uh, you only get information when they swim by a listening station, right? So we actually tagged this animal on no search and uh, spent several months in the Gulf uh, up, through, uh, up through April. And then two months later, uh, it left one of our artificial reefs and showed up uh, on an array of receivers out of the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so it just goes to show you that some of these animals are moving uh, much further than we would have anticipated. So we're always learning new things, really exciting stuff. So anyway, lots of people to acknowledge, of course, our funding sources, the Texas State Aquarium, uh, Heart Research Institute. Uh, thank you again, Chris and, and OSEARCH crew for all your help with Expedition GOMEX. Uh, colleagues at NOAA Fisheries and uh, Texas A&M who are um, helping us really leverage what we started here uh, into something bigger. So thanks for your attention.